Well, good morning and welcome to you. Welcome to Morning Mail for Friday, March the 18th, 2022. Wonderful to be with you today. Hope your day's doing well. We're going to cover a little bit today in Ephesians chapter 4, remind you about Sunday and the opportunities of Bible study and worship then and what topics we'll be looking at and uh, also have opportunity to pray. Let's begin with the prayer as we get started this morning. Loving Father, thank you again for the day and the past night's rest. You do so much for us in your care and your provision. Sometimes we just overlook and don't realize you are the source and that we ought to be grateful and express that gratefulness and gratitude. Father, thank you for this new day. I pray that the opportunities of the day will not go unobserved, but rather that we will see them, we will look for ways to use them, and that you would be glorified as the good news of Jesus is spread by our lives and by our words. Father, I pray for those who are in need of our prayers because of sickness in their lives. We know so many that are dealing with various illnesses, cancer and COVID, uh, other difficulties of physical life. And I pray, Father, for each and every one of them, and I know that you know them in their circumstances. And I just pray you bless and be with them and help us, Father, to be with them as they go through these times. But Father, we're also mindful, as we have been for a couple of weeks now, of the situation in Ukraine. For the brethren there and for just the country in general, things are not sounding good at all. Things, you know, the, what we hear in the news, the speculation, the posturing that's going on, we're just concerned about it all. And we pray, Father, that soon you will reveal the direction things are going and, and we know that you are in charge and in control. Bless us in our time together this morning, and through this day, we ask in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, let me ask you to begin with to think about this basic truth. The more united we are as the body of Christ, the Lord's church, the easier it will be for people to see through us what God really offers them. The Apostle Paul wrote to the Ephesian congregation about this kind of unity. Open your Bibles with me, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 4, and I want to read verses 2 through 6. with all humility and gentleness, with patience, showing tolerance for one another in love, being diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. There is one body and one Spirit, just as also you were called in one hope of your calling, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. In verse 3 of that passage, Paul called upon Christians to be diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit in the bond of peace. Now that Greek word translated be diligent means to hold back nothing. The tense of that verb indicates that this is something that is to be done continually. This was Christ's priority for the church. Shortly before the nails pierced his hands and he was lifted up on the cross, Jesus prayed, and turn with me over to that prayer in the Gospel of John, chapter 17, 
And that prayer is recorded, or at least the portion that we want to read, is in verses 20 to 23. Jesus prayed in the garden, I do not ask on behalf of these alone, but for those also who believe in me through their word, that they may all be one, even as you, Father, are in me and I in you, that they may also be in us, so that the world may believe that you sent me. The glory which you have given me, I have given to them, that they may be one, just as we are one. I in them, and you in me, that they may be perfected in unity, so that the world may know that you sent me, and love them, even as you have loved me. See, Jesus hopes to find people bearing with one another in love and giving all they can to keep the unity of the Spirit. He longs to see his prayer answered. Well, let's ask then, how is this unity achieved? Unity originates with God. Paul wrote in verses 4, 5, and 6 that we just read from Ephesians 4 about seven one phrases. One body, one spirit, one hope, one Lord, one faith, one baptism, one God. Notice that the emphasis of these seven phrases is God. Specifically, the oneness of God. The concept of oneness is inseparable from God. Therefore, the Father, the Son, and the Spirit are one. No rivalry exists within the Trinity. In the Godhead, we see perfect unity. Now, from this otherworldly unity of the Godhead comes a reflection of that unity into this world. It appears in the body of Christ, the Lord's Church. The, the one body is united in the eyes and mind of God. There is only one body because there is only one spirit who brings it all together. This unity comes into our world in one hope, one faith, one baptism, and above all, one Lord. We believe in one Lord. We are baptized into one Lord. We set our hope on the return of the one Lord. The oneness comes to our world in a family, the family of God, the Lord's Church. Because we have only one God and Father of all, who is over all and through all and in all. Only one family exists. When Paul told the Corinthians, excuse me, not the Corinthians, the Ephesian Christians, to be diligent to preserve the unity of the Spirit and the bond of peace, he did not instruct us to create unity. Only God can do that. We become united when we come to Christ in accordance with what the Bible says. We have the same Father and the same Lord and the same Spirit indwells us. God has seen to that. 
the Bible tells us to focus on God. It calls Christians to look to God, who is Father, Son, and Spirit. We should see Him as the God of perfect unity, the God of holy harmony, the God of divine oneness, and the God of eternal fellowship. We discover in God the true meaning of oneness, harmony, and love. Having encountered these qualities in God, we strive to show them to our world through the body of Jesus Christ, the church. Now, we cannot create unity, but we can so behave so as to promote unity. Look back again with me to verse 2 here in Ephesians 4. Paul exhorted Christians to walk, quote, with all humility and gentleness, with patience, end quote. Those are three essential attitudes that Paul mentions. First, he says Christians are to have complete humility. Well, where does humility come from? Is humility something you just decide to have in your life? No. Humility comes from encountering God. All the people in the Bible who were examples of humility had something in common, an encounter with God. They were astonished at the greatness, the power, the majesty of God. It happened to Abraham at Mount Moriah, Genesis 22, verses 1 to 18, and to Moses beside the burning bush, Exodus 3, verse 1 through chapter 4, verse 17. David was startled and awed by the starry handiwork of the Creator, Psalm 19. The prophet Isaiah realized his own inadequacy when he met the Lord face to face in the temple, Isaiah 6, verses 1 to 5, and the Apostle John, exiled on the island of Patmos, fell down at the feet of the Son of Man, Revelation chapter 1, verses 12 to 17. An encounter with God's greatness brings people to their knees. Until you and I sense the greatness of God, pride will prevail. Pride prompts us to shrink our concept of God just as an image on a photocopier is reduced to the size that suits the operator. Pride also causes us to reduce the value we see in people. Coming face to face with God's greatness puts our values in proper perspective. Seeing God as He really is changes the way we look at ourselves and at others. Paul spoke of a second attitude that promotes harmony, gentleness. Well, what is gentleness? I can show you what it is not. Suppose you are stopped in your car at a traffic light. A car traveling in the other direction has been given the signal it's clear for them to make a left turn. As the driver starts making the turn in front of you, at least that was his intention, 
Unfortunately, about halfway into the turn, the car acts as if it were having convulsions. It's sputtering and backfiring. And behind that struggling car is a sporty green truck with an irritated driver who, place, who had places to go and things to do. He blasts his horn at the disabled car and assaults the driver with crude words. Now, you would likely think something like this. That is how we treat people who are not doing what we want them to do. We are harsh with people who have problems, who make mistakes, and who fail to measure up to our expectations. Jesus calls on us to act gently, without being angry, without holding grudges. Jesus gives us his spirit so that we can be gentle. Third, an attitude that promotes harmony in the Lord's church is patience. The King James Version has the word long-suffering. The original Greek word literally means long-tempered. And it conveys an idea completely the opposite by what we mean by short-tempered. Short-tempers do not belong in the Lord's church. Have you ever examined a food package? On the side, we often find a listing of minimum requirements for good nutrition. It lists the vitamins we need to stay healthy. In our text, Paul listed the minimum requirements for unity in the Lord's church. Humility, gentleness, patience. In addition to the, those attitudes needed for maintaining unity, Paul gave a necessary action. He called it, quote, showing forbearance to one another in love, end quote, there in verse 2. I'll have comments about that attitude on Monday's Morning Mail as, as we continue looking at the unity Paul describes. As we close this morning, before we have our prayer, let me tell you about Sunday. As usual, our Bible classes are at 9.30 on Sunday morning. Del Hollingsworth continues to teach in the auditorium. The subject is worship in song. It's a good study, and I hope you can be with us then as Dale leads our thoughts. At 10.30 on Sunday morning, our worship service will begin. And in addition to prayers and songs, we have opportunity, as we do every Lord's Day, every first day of the week, to remember the death and suffering of Jesus in the communion service. The sermon for Sunday morning is uh, the third sermon in a new series we began two weeks ago, uh, entitled, In the Footsteps of Jesus. Sunday's lesson talks about walking with a mission like Jesus did. And we're going to be looking at Luke chapter 19, the first 10 verses. Sunday evening, our worship service is at 6 p.m. And we'll be resuming our study of from the series of lessons on last things. Specifically, we're going to talk about the resurrection of the dead. Last time we, we had a sermon, we talked about the second coming. Now we're going to talk about the resurrection. In fact, the next several lessons are going to be talking about things that, that happen at the same time for, for all practical purposes, simultaneous to the return of Jesus. I hope you can be with me 
uh, and be with us for any and all of these services. Bible class at 9.30, worship at 10.30, and again at 6 p.m. Love to have you here in person. If not, look forward to join you, joining you here on Facebook or YouTube. Let's close now our time together this morning with a prayer. Gracious Father, we thank you. We thank you for your many blessings and you, that you do for us, and we thank you, Father, for the Lord's church. The body of Christ, family, your family, that we meet together and that we are been, come together in unity to do your will with patience and humility, with gentleness, seeking to do what we can to exalt and glorify you and to share the good news of the gospel of Christ with those of this world that need it so desperately. Bless us, Father, that we might always grow in this humility and patience and gentleness, that you, the unity of the church might be even greater and might strive to, to expand the walls of the kingdom. We thank you again for the Christ, and we pray in his name. Amen. Well, I pray that your Friday and Saturday and Sunday are great, that you have opportunity on Sunday to worship uh, together with the saints, and I look forward to being back with you on Monday morning at 10 o'clock for Morning Mail.